Welcome into the Free Outside Podcast. I am Jeff Garmeyer, and I just got back from a backpacking trip. I just needed to get out. Last week was rough. I had a photo shoot that went till 11 p.m. on Tuesday and Wednesday. Just beat down, needed to get out there. And I had a great trip. First four miles went perfectly. And then around 8,000 feet, I hit continual snow. That's when I pulled out the map and looked, and it was like, Yep, apparently I'm going up to 10,000 feet. I kept going, followed the plan. I was going to loop around by two awesome lakes. But soon I was post-holing, getting all the reprieve and uh, motivation that I needed and decided to change the plan. I was just out there for an adventure and some enjoyment, kind of a mental health reset after a stressful week last week, and I got it all. So after trudging, I made it up to the ridge I was aiming for and then just found a trail to climb down and get to a campsite sooner. Dropped pretty low, set up camp. I think I'll make a video about it, put it out on Wednesday or something. If you want to watch any of these interviews or these solo casts, free outside on YouTube. Put them all up there. Subscribe, like, anything helps. Watch them in the background. You know how it works. Five-star reviews, welcome. So I got my mental health reset with some backpacking was planning to go like 28 miles and I made it like 17 or something oh well gotta be willing to change I only wore road shoes and road running shoes and short socks so the post holding kind of beat up my legs but worth it to get out there okay today's topic is a fun one 200 milers in honor of Tahoe 200 going on and the finisher will have finished by the time this comes out so Let's dive into the history of pedestrianism, the history of 200s, where they're going, why they're appealing, because they're such a different crowd than like the Western states or UTMB. So let's dive into how, why they started, where they're at now, how many there even are. All right, let's get into it. Blah, blah, blah. I've run a number of 200 mile races myself, and I... I'm just curious why they're so popular. But in order to get to 200 mile races, we got to go way, way back, like to the early 19th century. We're talking like 1800s, the early 1800s. This is when pedestrianism started. Pedestrianism is like competitive walking. Now ultra runners have to call it power hiking to feel cool about themselves. But this was like one of the most popular sports in the entire country. In the 1800s it peaked in the mid 19th century just to confuse everyone i'll just switch between 19th century and 1800s but they're about the same so the events were just in large stadiums thousands of people would watch there was wagering on people they were witnessing people walk around a track continuously one famous guy captain robert barclay all all our dice I looked his name up. I did a little research. I got away from my roots. Known as Captain Barclay, he completed a thousand miles in a thousand hours in 1809. And I don't know how many days a thousand hours is, but it seems like it's probably like 40 or something. So four times two times 24 would be like 96. So 40 would be 960. So it's about 42 days. And this really got everything started in 1809. Everyone was captivated by it, looking towards future endurance challenges. And then you have Edward Payson, Edward Payson West. Everyone has three names back then. It's kind of weird. He got famous by walking from Portland, Maine to Chicago, Illinois in 1867. That's like 1,326 miles, 1,326 miles in 30 days. And this got a ton of media attention. The sport blew up. Then you have Daniel O'Leary. He was Irish American and he gained fame by winning a six day walking match. That's what they call them. They were walking matches, which is hilarious. It's basically a through hike in 1875, but instead of a through hike, he just walked in circles. So in 1875, this, uh, Danny O'Leary buddy, he covered 500 miles earning a big prize. I couldn't find the amount of the prize, but let's say it was huge hugest prize you've ever seen and the six-day race became a staple of pedestrian competition six-day races are actually still around today uh fixed time has blown up and 
you know, some date back to, I believe, across the years, started in the early 1980s. But they really have to thank the 1870s for the rise of fixed time races. There's still six day events today. And I've been out at a couple, but I've only ever done a 48 hour. I did like 200 something miles then. I think just 200 miles. Oh, well, doesn't matter. Look me up on Ultra Sign Up if you care. But that's when six day races blew up and fixed time stuff became a staple of these pedestrian competitions. I can't believe people would sit and watch people walk around a track for multiple days, but I guess there was a lot of drinking back then, which you'd probably have to do, assuming it wasn't the prohibition, and they would bet on them. So I think it's like a horse race that just develops really, really slowly. Like imagine the Kentucky Derby, but you sit and start watching it and it doesn't end until a week later. That's basically what pedestrianism was, and it was for a while like the most popular sport why did it die well you know they invented things like bicycles so cycling became more popular because it's faster and you can cover more miles in a shorter amount of time and then baseball blew up many other sports just took over once they hit mainstream and the uh modern sports world was born but just imagine if pedestrianism was what took off and today we went out to i don't know What's a stadium? Mile High Stadium in Denver. I could only think of that because I lived there. And you just watch people walk for six days. That was the biggest event in the country, like ESPN covering race walking, like interviews with competitors like, uh, Jebediah, how did your race go? Well, you know, I just kept a solid pace, kept walking and ate a cheeseburger every time around. I had one beer per hour, and that kept the calories flowing. We haven't heard of electrolytes yet, so I didn't have any. All right, back to you at ESPN. Yeah, that's crazy that it was such a thing, but I think the betting aspect had a lot to do with it. And now let's get into running. How did 200 milers start? Well, I think it really goes back to Western states being the origin of the 100 mile race and that only started by accident there was this thing called the tevis cup 100 mile horseback riding event and in 1973 uh, gordy ainsley's horse went lame so he couldn't finish it i believe i'm getting this right if not let me know in the comments but still give me five stars i'm looking for five star reviews anyways fast forward to the next year gordy ainsley made history obviously because no one else had ever done it but in 1974, instead of doing the race on a horse, he did it on foot. And the cutoff for this course was 24 hours on horse. So doable. But what he did was did it all on foot. He just getting water from streams. He didn't really have any idea what he was doing. It sounded hot. There's a really good documentary out there if you want to look it up on YouTube. But then he completed it in 23 hours and some change, I think 23 hours, 42 minutes. And the idea for the Western States endurance run was born. And in 1977, it became the inaugural hundred mile race in the United States. Maybe the world didn't do that much research. And a few people showed up that year and it's just blown up since then. It's very hard to get in the lottery these days. It's the premier race. It's thought of as sort of the Super Bowl of ultra running in the United States, at least in the 100 mile distance. But other races exist too. And in 1983, Leadville 100 started. See, we're still not to 200s because it's a big build to how these, these things started. And, you know, you have to walk before you can run. Wait. Yeah, because pedestrianism first. There we go. So founded in 1983 in Leadville by Ken, oh boy, Kluber. We'll go with it. He created the uh, Leadville 100 just so that he could bring a boost to the local economy because they closed the mine. Leadville's historically a mining town and it's kind of fallen on harder times just with that drop in mining it used to be one of the richest places some of the richest people in history actually lived there it's pretty crazy uh one guy can't even remember his name didn't look him up but he had so much wealth and then just burned it on stupid art and stuff like that not cool art stupid art anyways the leadville 100 is known because of the high altitude and a lot of elite runners go there it's one of the premier ones it's a pretty big event now. I think like 600 people do it, maybe 800, some amount of hundreds do it every year. So these 100 mile races were like 
the stepping stone to something bigger. They set the table for going faster, further, going through harder things. But, you know, once people started doing Western states in a time where they didn't even need a headlamp, there needed to be more adventure. So in 2008, I believe, there was a New England 200. Only like five people signed up, and the cutoff was actually 72 hours, which if you've ever done a 200-mile race, especially in the early 2000s, that's pretty hard. I think only two people finished, and only one was even under the cutoff. So tough start. But then from there, Tour de Jantz was born. Uh, it goes through the Italian Alps. It gains like 80,000 feet of gain. It started in 2010, if I didn't already say that. Uh, Tour de Jantz translates to Tour of Giants in our good old American English here, America. And it's a 205-mile race. Uh, it's really grueling terrain. So 80,000 feet over 200 miles. That's a lot of feet per mile if you're doing the math. What is that, like 400 feet per mile? So that's tough if you've ever been on a trail like that. It's just known for how difficult it is and how hard it is to keep pushing. Like it's easy for people to set a good goal and then watch it slip away. Talk to numerous runners who've done it, but they love it. It's also really hard. And Tour de Jantz really showed that people are willing to do 200 mile races and stuff that's tougher than a hundred miles, something that's more immersive where you literally have to go out and be out there for at least a couple nights. So then the triple crown of 200s was sort of born. Not really all at the same time. But the concept of 200 milers was proven. It was like a, what do you call it? Hey, uh, man, I can't remember the business term. Proof of concept, I believe. With a couple of them working, people signing up and going for them. And so Candace Burt, in 2014, she was already a race director, came up with the idea for Tahoe 200. 2014, around Lake Tahoe, which seems crazy, just trying to get permitting for a race like that. But it traveled around Lake Tahoe, and it quickly blew up. It's like the accessible thing in one of the most beautiful areas of the country. I actually lived in Tahoe for six months and worked at a ski resort. I believe I said it on a previous episode, but maybe I just said it in my head. But anyways, this was the first of the 200 mile races. And then, you know, this one with forests, lake views, mountaintops, heat, all sorts of difficult things to overcome, 40,000 feet of gain, 100 hours to complete it. With this and seeing the rise in it, shortly thereafter, about a year later, Bigfoot 200 started, also by Candace Burt. And this one's in the Cascade Mountains, basically from Mount St. Helens-ish, Mount Adams area, I guess more so. Eh, Mount St. Helens, we'll go with that. To sort of the doorstep of, of Mount Rainier is where this one goes. It's 206 miles, 42,000 feet of gain, 105 hour cutoff, but it goes through with these massive forests. This is about an hour from where I grew up. So I know, well, there's like rocks, there's great views, but then there's also these forests with, you know, lush Pacific Northwest vegetation and everything. And there's basically no cell service. I was out there pacing and crewing for a runner that I coach. And I've actually coached runners who've done all these ones that I'm highlighting, except for Tour de Jantz. Uh And it is really immersive. I think that's the draw for it. It's not like you can do a live stream or have much more than just watching a spot tracker on a map. This one is like you are out there. The there's a law actually in one of the counties that it goes through that it's illegal to kill Bigfoot or maybe it's shoot Bigfoot. Maybe you can stab him. I'm not sure, but that's how out there it is. And that's how unique these communities are. There's basically no towns. There's very few roads you even cross. It's an adventure. That one took off. Now it's thought of as a bucket list for a lot of people in the 200 mile scene. And then let's fast forward to 2017 and Moab 240. It took 200s about 40 more miles because now it's 240 and it's around Moab. If you couldn't guess, it has, it's more desert heat, technical, and it's a hard course, 29,000 feet of gain. You have 112 hours to complete it. And I think the weather in the rugged terrain, if you've ever run out by Moab is really the, uh, the pain point or the crux of of that race. And then, so in 2017, that's when the combo of all three races directed by Candace Burt and destination trail races launched the triple crown of two hundreds where runners will sign up for literally all three of them 
and try to complete them as fast as they can. And the one who completes the combination of all of them the fastest, they win the triple crown in 200s. The trick is if you don't finish one of them, which there's fairly high DNF rate in these, which DNF means did not finish if you didn't know. If you don't finish one of them, you're out of the triple crown. So it's really hard. Last year, they had to postpone Tahoe, I believe because of snow. And so it meant that Tahoe was, let's say, July something. And then Bigfoot 200 was two and a half weeks later. So I actually coached an athlete and it was so tricky to figure out how to recover from one 200 and be ready for the next 200. So we basically treated it as rest, went on like one run to remember how to run again. And then he was out at Bigfoot 200 along with all the other runners doing the triple crown of 200s just two and a half weeks after the last 200. So it's pretty crazy schedule. Usually they're spaced out about a month and a half to two months. So it's a lot more attainable in the normal year. But with Tahoe having moved a few times just because of fire and snowpack and things like that, that it, it can be pretty daunting feat. And now the Triple Crown of 200s, it's not only a race, but it's just like a prestigious achievement for a lot of different people. It's the goal of you build up to wanting to do this for multiple years, and then you go after all three in the same year. It's so immersive, but it also just takes over your whole summer because in a normal year, it's one's in June, one's in early August, and the other's in late September or October. Can't remember. Either way, it just takes over a whole year, but it is a huge goal for a lot of people especially if you have a lot of money, because these things are not cheap. But then when I think 200s exploded was Cocodona 250. It was going to launch in 2020, and then COVID knocked it back. But what makes Cocodona special is it goes through a totally different set of landscapes, and it goes through towns. There's a whole live stream, so it's the introduction of 200s to the masses. Like People can watch and follow along and see through all these towns. They can experience parts of Arizona they didn't know about. It starts with the near the saguaro cacti of northern Phoenix, climbs immediately up into the Bradshaw Mountains. And all this time, there's a live stream. There's like drones out there. There's co color commentators and play-by-play -play commentators, believe it or not. Play-by-play -play for a 200-mile race, 250-mile race. Kind of crazy. But it, it winds through old mining towns like Jerome, crosses the desert once again by Cottonwood, goes through Sedona, winds around into Flagstaff, hits Prescott somewhere in there. It's got 42,000 feet of gain, 125-hour cutoff. And this was the rise. This is like the March Madness of a festival where there's a live stream going for five days. You hear stories of people who are working on one computer and the other screen has the Cocodono 250 going. It was just a way to have engaging comment or wow, engaging content. And even more so the live chat is crazy. Like you could just go hang out with people in a live chat. It's sort of like a Reddit message board, but it's going with live feed, live people talking to each other the whole time, wondering what's going to happen, asking about where their runner is. And this I think was also the introduction to the ability for maybe through hikers or people doing FKTs to see where they could do well in the 200 mile space. Cause it is a really direct correlation where you have to be comfortable at night. You have to be comfortable with gear. That's more substantial than a hundred mile race. Like I said, you don't even need a headlamp if you're going to win Western States. It's pretty crazy how fast that is, but at 200, you're for sure going through a couple different nights. So you need to have things like headlamps charged up. You need to be able to recharge your phone. You need to change into night gear. You go through different environments from like 2000 feet up to over 10,000 feet. So it brings in this new level of adventure, planning, immersement into it. People hallucinate. And last year, a couple different through hikers were in the top 15 of the entire race, just through hiking backgrounds. Uh, in 2023, Josh Perry, who set FKTs on the Pacific Crest Trail, the Long Trail, the Arizona Trail, he got second overall. I found myself in sixth almost every year, actually still nursing an injury from this year. But anyways, it's this whole new type of adventure from, I don't know, a more marketed 200-mile run. This one's like a lot of hiking, but you have to be able to run on the flat sections too. 
with an attainable cutoff. And then even along with it, there's the Sedona canyons with like a couple day cutoff as well. I think it's like a 48 hour cutoff. So it's a 125 mile race. That's this intro that probably the most attainable way to get a hundred mile finish with such an appealing number of hours to complete a 125 mile race. So Cocodona was really where it drew in lots of people as to what you can do out there and apply to different disciplines that, you know, cross over. And I always like to say, are a lot more intertwined than people think. Some of the downfalls, the crazy things about 200 milers are the price. I think I just paid like 1800 bucks to sign up for Coca on the next year. That's a lot of money if you didn't know. And this I think is a challenge for a lot of people, especially if you're doing the triple crown of 200s, you're comp you're committing like five or six thousand dollars to sign up for these things that are going to take over your whole year, then throw in 10 to 15 hours a week of training for these things. And then getting a crew or pacers or even just nutrition for the whole thing can be overwhelming. So with that, it kind of fleshes out some of the people that maybe especially the through hiker style that are seasonal job to through hike, that type of thing, where you could stretch $1,000 over a month of hiking versus $1,000 just to sign up for a four day run. But one of the big things that has drawn me into 200s more and more is the community and the camaraderie with a race that long. It is a race, but you're really chatting with everyone out there. There's a tight knit group that are at races every single year. You're chatting a lot of the time rather than sprinting against each other because like mile 50, you still got 200 miles to go. You're joking with people. Last year I was joking with Jake Jackson a little bit, just mile 50, multiple other people. You see your friends out there and you're just like on the long run with friends. So, then of course it gets hard and you have to push through things like hallucinations and sleep deprivation and raw feet and stuff like that, digestive issues, all kinds of stuff like that. But it is a really cool get together of like-minded people that want to push their boundaries, go after a time goal, push an insane amount of miles as fast as they want. Similar to through hiking, people tackling like the PCT, they are all going after a similar thing, pushing really hard for a long time just going after that terminus goal. And it's more about the journey than the destination rather than something shorter where you're really just focused on where you're going to finish. If you're going to beat people, how fast you can move every step A 200 is just a totally different mindset. And I think why these are getting more and more popular, there's like 23 of them that I could find now. I think that's in the USA alone. I don't know. I don't have notes here, but the cool thing is these races are in some of the most beautiful places like Bigfoot. You get views of Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Hood to the south. Like you get these awesome views. You're in this immersive environment. You're going through the woods and sometimes the distance between aid stations is like 20 miles. So that's a long chunk to push through. These are hard. It's the difficulty and the location combination that really makes them like a mini through hike or like an FKT. So it's a really cool style. And then you get to bring other people in like a crew or a pacer and share that experience with others. So I think that's part of the draw and why they're increasing and just the desire for us all as our lives get more and more comfortable every year to keep pushing our limits. I think it's just a really cool way to have a goal out there and to push towards it. And back to the price point, these races are just so expensive. Some are a few hundred dollars more attainable, but some are up to like $2,000 just because they got to cover everything from aid stations to medical logistics. Like Cocodona, I think has 20 aid stations. So it's just pretty crazy that they can even put on this many different 200 mile events. So there's kind of the overview of 200s, what I think of them, why they're cool, why they're unique, little history from pedestrianism which is also awesome to modern era 200s, which are just blowing up, increasing all over the world. They're just going to keep going that way. And these things are selling out so quickly. Cocodona sold out within like two weeks of the race ending. The race entry actually opens up during the race, which is going to be a problem in the future because if you're running the race, you're going to need to have service to sign up for that sucker for the next year 
while you're in the race the current year. And I think there's six of us now who've done it every single year. It's going to get harder and harder to get in that thing to keep doing it. So thank you for joining on this journey through the rise of 200s. And remember, like, subscribe, leave a comment, five-star review. These are all on YouTube, too. You can check them out. All right, I think we're going to call that it for today. Thank you for joining me on the Free Outside podcast. I'm your host with the most, Jeffrey Frederick Garmeyer, also known as Legend. And until next time, stay elite, my friends.